board for review in today's public hearing. At this time, I'd ask everyone to either turn off their cell phones or put them on silent as not to disrupt today's meeting. The procedure will be for staff to introduce the case record. At conclusion of our presentation, the appellant will present their case to the board along with any person in support. If there is opposition to a case, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition has presented their testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. The board and their rules provides for cases without opposition, five minutes total for the appellant, including members of the public, speaking in support of the appeal, to present their case and supporting comments. For cases that have opposition, the rules provide the appellant, including members of the public, speaking in support of the appeal, 10 minutes total for their presentation and rebuttal of the opposition's presentation. For members of the public speaking in opposition, 10 minutes is provided. This is 10 minutes total for all speakers combined and not 10 minutes for each speaker. For members of the public that want to submit comments to be entered into the, the record prior to the meeting that are either in support of or opposition to an appeal, the comments must be submitted to the board staff no later than five days prior to the public hearing. Send those comments to the STRP board at Nashville.gov. Documentation supporters or opponents wish, that wish to provide to the board after the deadline can be presented to board members by providing eight copies at public hearing. However, the board may elect to defer cases in order to review any materials received after the deadline. The Metro Code requires that these proceedings be taped. Therefore, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward, speak into the microphone, identify yourself, and then make your presentation. It should be noted if, anyone, if it is found that anyone has prevent, presented false or misleading testimony to the board that would have affected the board's decision, any approval may be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing. The board will go through the cases set for public hearing today. After both sides of the case presentations are made, the board will discuss and vote on the case. The board is vested with the power to act on the cases before us today under provisions as outlined in section 628.035 of the Metropolitan Code. The code requires four members of the seven member board to be present to constitute a quorum. The board rules require a majority vote in the affirmative of members pr present to grant the appellants application. In the event that a majority vote is not reached, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next regularly scheduled public hearing. Applications that fail to receive a majority affirmative vote at the next regularly scheduled public hearing shall be deemed denied by operational law. The appellant or any aggrieved property owner may request a rehearing within 60 days of this public hearing. Further, the appellant or any agreed property owner may also appeal the board's decision to transfer court within that same 60-day period. After that time has elapsed, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If you are an appellant and your case is granted, it will be necessary for you to obtain the permit for which you have applied. It should be noted that a permit must be obtained within two years for a board approval to remain valid. I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order all appellants have been notified by certified mail as required by the code. All affected property owners have been notified and the legal notification sign requirements have been met by the code. We do have one case, 2023-61, which is withdrawn. Chair Caputo, before we move on to the cases to be heard, we would like to take this opportunity to recognize any elected officials who are in attendance. I do not see any. Um, also for today's meeting the microphones need to be turned on to to speak oh they do yes ma'am yeah, push okay. to talk push to mute
again, my apologies for the delay. We are getting there, getting there. In the meantime, uh, the first case we're gonna hear is uh, Brendan and Christine Callahan. Great. So it, we have Mrs. Callahan, I presume, okay. Is anyone here in either support or opposition to the Callahan case? No? Ms. Callahan, if you'd like, you can come on up and take a seat and we will get started in just a second. You guys give me the high sign when you're ready to go. You're good? Okay, super. All right. <clears throat> Terrific. Case We're gonna hear from Metro first, ma'am, and then we'll get started with you, okay? Case 2023-50, Brendan and Chris, Christine Callaghan, appellant <coughs> and owner of the property located at 1121 A Cahaw Avenue. The appellant is challenging the zoning administrator's decision to revoke a short-term rental permit due to the residence is not the owner's primary dwelling as required by law. 1121A Cahal is part of a horizontal property regime. Um, it's a two, one and two family dwelling. So there are two uh, houses on this lot. The law requires both of these to be owned by the owner in order to be eligible for an owner occupied permit. Property is zoned R6. On August 30th, 2022, host compliance hotline tip was received. Owners do not live at the property. Inspector John Feltz opened a case file and began an investigation. Inspector Feltz found that Ms. Christine Callaghan is a realtor in Boca Raton, Florida, license number 3219749, and that the Callaghans own several properties in Florida and Nashville. He found that the, their property located at 514 Enfield Road, Delray Beach, Florida, has a homestead exemption registered with the Palm, County, Palm Beach County Property Assessor, and that they have had the homestead exemption on that property since 2018. The homestead exemption is defined as follows. In the state of Florida, a $25,000 exemption is applied to the first $50,000 of your property's assessed value if your property is your permanent residence and you own the property on January 1 of the tax year. Other properties, all of which have the Callaghan's address as 514 Enfield Road, Delro Delray Beach, Florida, on the property deeds and property taxes. 638 Southwest 4th Avenue, Boynton Beach, Florida. 1341 West 31st Street, Riviera Beach, Florida. 332 Southeast Street, Lake Worth Beach, Florida. 817 Third Avenue North, Unit 406, Nashville, Tennessee. 309 Urban Place, Nashville, Tennessee. Mary Christine Callaghan has an active voter registration with the Florida Secretary of State for 514 Enfield Road, Delray Beach, Florida. Brendan and Christine Callaghan own Emerald Holdings, LLC, currently listed as in good standing with the Alaska Division of Corporations, Business and Professional Licensing with the mailing address of Florida Secretary of State for 514 Enfield Road, Delray Beach, Florida. October 3rd, 2022, the revocation letter was sent. The law requires us to give 15 days notice before the revocation goes into effect. Therefore, the revocation will go into effect on October 18th, 2022. On October 17, 2022, Inspector Feltz posted a stop work order at the property. He also printed a copy of the Airbnb website ad. On December 12, 2022, short-term rental appeal filed. They were to appear on the February 22, 2022 docket, but withdrew due to previous travel plans. I think that should be 2023. In order for the Callaghans to be eligible for an owner-occupied permit, the STRP ordinance requires that they own both units of the HPR two-family dwelling. One side would have to be their principal or permanent residence, then they could obtain an owner-occupied permit for the other unit. Inspector Felt's investigation shows that the current status of 1121 A and B Cahal Avenue is that both units are currently being rented on a long-term basis. As evidenced by Inspector Felt's affidavit, he has spoken with the lady at Unit B, he has asked her if the Callaghan, Callaghans live there, 
and she replied they did not. He found that the tenant's name is Daniel D. Loggins. Mr. Loggins' automobile and Tennessee driver's licenses are registered at 1121B Cahaw Avenue. Unit A is also being rented long-term as evidenced by long-term website advertisements on hot pads by Zillow and on Airbnb. On Wednesday, July 12, 2023, Ms. Callaghan sent an email with two attachments to be included in your packet. One is a rental customer report for 514 Enfield Road, Delray Beach, Florida. The second is an Airbnb advertisement for 514 Enfield Road, Delray Beach, Florida. However, one note to mention is that on page three of the Airbnb ad, Ms. Callaghan is listed as the co-host. The caption reads, works and resides in Delray. Great. Joey, something to add before we hear from Ms. Callaghan? Yes, thanks members. Uh, Joey Hargis, Zoning Administrator. Um, Mr. Osborne did a good job of uh, summing up the case. I just wanted to point out uh, facts for you guys. We do occasionally get these and I just wanted to kind of flesh out a little bit more reasons for the denial or revocation on my part. Um, the homestead exemption in, in Florida, um, Tennessee does not have one similar. Um, right. And I'm reading from the Secretary of State's website here. Um, and Mr. Osborne covered it, but one thing it asks in on the website in the frequently asked questions list is, do I need to reply? Do I need to reapply for a homestead exemption each year? And the answer is no. We'll renew your homestead exemption annually, as long as you continue to qualify for the exemption. Uh, and it comes down to uh, you must contact us if you no longer qualify for the exemption. This may include uh, death of the uh, divorce, marriage, or this is no longer your permanent residence. Um, so given the fact uh, Mr. Feltz also contacted Secretary of State's office uh, there in uh, Palm Beach County and confirmed a 2023 filing had occurred uh, that, that had been renewed uh, for that. So based upon those, those reasons, uh, we've denied. But um, just I want to give the board some flesh out on, on these types of homestead exemptions. When we see them, we will uh, double check to make sure is it still active, you know. <clears throat> Not to say someone can't move here from that, from, um, you know, it doesn't, permanently ban them for 2023, but you know, I either cancel your homestead exemption from the state of Florida and give it up, uh, provide us documentation that you do live on the premises full time, and uh, we'd certainly uh, look at issuing the permit then. But I'm, I'm here uh, if you have any questions, but I thought um, I had not seen the summary, so I thought that was a very good summary. So he covered just about everything I wanted to say. Thank you. Terrific. Great. Okay, before we hear from Ms. Callahan, does anyone have any questions either for Mr. Osborne or for Joey? Nope. Okay. Hi, Ms. Callahan. I'm sorry, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Okay, great. Um, so you heard the instructions. I believe you have 10 minutes to speak. Um, there's no one here to speak in opposition, so you can feel free to use that time as you see fit. And why don't you go ahead and tell us about your situation? Um, just a quick Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's only five minutes if there's no opposition. I am so sorry. It's been a long time since we had a hearing. So <laughs> I apologize. Thank you, Anne. It's five minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes would be a long time. So five minutes. Sorry about that. Terrific. Uh-huh. Sure. I don't think you're going to need 10 minutes. Why don't you tell us what you... Okay, well, it was five. I misspoke. We're not going to change the rules. It's five minutes. That's my... I apologize for misspeaking, but it's five minutes. So we're not going to change the rules today. So... Julie? See how you do. Yeah. Can we have her turn on her microphone and identify herself, please? Oh, yeah. Ma'am, before you get started, you're going to have to make sure your microphone is open and you're gonna state your name and your address for the record and then tell us about your situation. I can also tell you that we tend to ask questions, so you'll probably get an opportunity to provide whatever information you're interested in sharing. How's that? Okay, my name is Chris, Ca can you hear me? Mm -hmm. My name is Chris Callahan, and I live at 1121B Cahal Avenue. After leaving Ireland, my family, including our two sons, settled in Nashville until 2009 until we moved to Florida. Our last home address in Florida was Enfield Road in Delray Beach. We all moved to Florida, including our oldest son, his wife, and our baby granddaughter. granddaughter. However, my son moved back to Nashville in 2016. 
At that time, my husband was settled in his job, my younger son was in college, and I was working full-time in the real estate business. I earn a living by buying, selling, renting, renovating, and recently new construction of residential properties. 1121 Cajal used to have just one property on it, and we demolished it and built two, 1121 A and B. We planned to live in one and rent out the other. I continued to work, to work towards my retirement. My husband retired in 2019 in July, and we decided to put um, Cajal on the Airbnb market, and we also decided to put Enfield Road on the Airbnb market. Now, I hold an active license in, in uh, real estate in Florida, which I intend to keep as long as it makes sense to do so. Having a license gives me access to valuable information as well as big savings on commissions when I sell a property. It may be a bit weird. Actually, I used to have a license here before I moved to Florida, and I held on to that one while I was still living in Florida. It may be a bit weird to work in two states, but when you've got a good team of people, it works very well. I have also, I actually lived in Delray the entire time we built the houses in Cajal, just with a couple of trips back and forth, but I lived down there the whole time. I also sold properties in Florida while living in Nashville without ever being present at the property. I also want to say that over this past 15 years, I have bought, sold, rented, renovated more than 70 houses. It's a huge responsibility to stay on top of all that. My main concern is always just to take care of the bills. I, I've never ever, I, I pay everything automatically so nothing gets missed. I have never had any reason to contact the, um, the city records to update mailing addresses. That's typically the, the responsibility of a title company. My family all live in Nashville now, our two sons and our two grandchildren now. I have no reason to live in Florida anymore. I receive mail at 1121B Cajal regularly because I have changed my mailing address in many places. I just want to say that in the public records there are some things that are not correct and other things that are simply just outdated. A lot of those properties that you mentioned that I own, I bought them while I lived in Enfield Drive, so that or Enfield Road, so that was the address um, used at the time. I also noticed that I recently sold some houses in in Florida. My old address of Elizabeth Street was on those public records because that's where I lived when I bought those properties. That was the last mailing address whenever I bought them. I'd moved six or seven times when we came here and not once did I ever call the city and let them know my new, my new mailing address. 309 Urban A is my son's house, just to give an example of an incorrect um, information. My son Tony lives in 309 Urban Place. He owns it at 100%, his name's on the deed, his name's on the mortgage. I've actually got the HUD statement to show you that and his electric bill, so that's wrong. I also own a house in Virginia Avenue. I recently refinanced that and the correct mailing address is on the deed and on the tax records. I also own a house on McClurkin Avenue. The title company made a mistake there. I recently split that lot and instead of putting my address, they put the property address. Regarding the Airbnb, I do not manage properties, any one of my properties, I don't manage them. I learned a very expensive lesson whenever I had the property on Airbnb. I used to work with a company called Turnkey. I ended up parting ways with them whenever they changed management and um, I got a lot of bad reviews. I had a lot of good reviews as well, however, and I was really disappointed. It was a very expensive lesson that whenever you change property management companies, you lose your reviews. I called Airbnb and I asked them, this is not fair, I can show you the deed, we own the property, we shouldn't lose reviews. They advised me that if I was a co-host, that I could keep the reviews if I ever had to change property management again. If you look at all the reviews on that Airbnb list, then you will see that my name is not mentioned anywhere. All of my guests love my property manager. His name is Danny. His name is mentioned on almost every review because he manages it 100%. I want nothing to do with managing it. It's oh. too much work. I'm okay, Ms. Callahan, thank you so much. <laughs> you covered a lot of ground. That's and, right. <laughs> and I'm sure that there will be questions that will allow you to share anything that you missed. Okay, who has questions for Ms. Callahan?
I guess I'll, I guess I'll begin. Um, so, if so, you're telling us that you do reside at 1121B. So, who was it that we have Inspector Feltz, um, who said in an affidavit that he spoke with a lady at Unit B, who I assume was not you. No. Who was that? You're going to have to open your mic again, ma'am. My, my son's friend is Danny, Daniel, uh, who you've got there. He lives with us. He's a, <clears throat> he's a struggling musician. He's rarely there, and he comes and stays with us. I believe that might have been a guard friend that he used to go with. I believe that may have been her. We, we're actually living our retirement exactly the way we planned. We were in Ireland three times last year. We also went on our 40th anniversary on a cruise. We also went to the wine country. I'm not trying to make you jealous, but we're just living our retirement the way we wanted. That, that so I may not have been there whenever, and right. she doesn't know me, I've never met her, but I did know that he was going with someone. So who, well, so who lives at 1121A? 1121A, whenever this happened, the property manager for 1121A um, started to advertise the property as a long-term rental because the permit for the short-term rental was revoked. So it's now rented um, to, there's, I think there's about three guys live there. They're in the construction business and their, and their employer put them there for eight months. Um, so we, because we weren't allowed to rent it on a short-term rental, they advertised it as a long-term rental. And they've been there for eight months and I believe that eight months is up at the end of August. So do, you, do, you know, do you know the gentlemen's names? No, I don't know any of my tenants. You I don't, don't manage my property. Your prop neighbours that share a wall with you, you don't know any of their names? No, a lot of them are Hispanic and a lot of them don't speak English. I have said hello to them once in a while, but to be honest with you, I don't want them to know oh. that I live next door and that I'm the owner of the property. Okay. For obvious reasons, you know, it's, I just don't want them to know that the landlord lives next door. I want the property manager to do his job. I don't want to get in the middle of that. Yeah, I mean, you respectfully, you, you wouldn't have to tell them you owned the property. You could just say, hey, here's my name, your, your neighbor. But I, I'm not going to tell you how I to... Have, I, have that, okay. I have done that. I'm a friendly neighbor, but I mean, I haven't actually, you know, I haven't... Thanks. I'll see if anybody else has questions. Thank you. Right. So I just wanted to... Um, review with you the m mention you made of urban place that you said that your husband your son owns that outright and that you do not I'm what we sure have on here is 309 urban place do you not indeed own 309a no i own 309b okay so you do own <laughs> that, that's we don't want to be disingenuous here you right. do own property at 309 urban this is not incorrect it is incorrect because urban urban um a there used to be one house there. Yeah. I tore it down and I built two. Right. But you own a property at 309 Urban. 309 B. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. But it's 309 A that you've got I don't in your think packet. It's, no, it, it doesn't say anything. It says 309 Urban Place. Honestly, it does because I saw it this morning. Well, and it's 309, and my son. No motive to lie to you. <laughs> I, I'm looking at the I'll packet. It says awesome. 309. Well, it, it's kind of neither here nor there. I just want to make sure that we're. There's nothing in here that's been stacked inappropriately. This is indeed listed in the property assessor's website that you own property at 309. So this isn't incorrect. It's perhaps incomplete, but it's well, not incorrect. Okay. Well, okay. fair enough. Fair, fair enough. enough. Right. Right. Um, so uh, to, to, to follow up on what Sean was asking you, the gentleman... You know him, Daniel. He's one that you do know. He's your yeah. son's friend. He's my son's But he son. said that you don't live there. He didn't say that. I think it may have been his girlfriend, which I've never met. Okay. Okay, fair enough. We've traveled quite a bit this year, too. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yes. Okay. Um... And you have, as, as Mr. Hargis said, you have maintained your homestead exemption for the state of Florida. I need to fix that, yeah. And you've maintained your voting documentation for the state of Florida. 
maintained signs like you need to do something to maintain it. I know that when we got our citizenship around 2009, I believe it was, we thought, oh, you know, we'll be able to vote now. And, and we set that up. At, in 2010, that was done. That was a long time ago. Uh, he, nothing's happened since then. And the same with the Emerald Properties. It was 2014. A lot of this stuff's old. But there's nothing new to suggest that you have really set up your home, your home as your primary home in Nashville. With all of the properties listed and all of the properties on the on the website, it seems like you're, you, as you say, this is your business. This is your this is your job. You have quite a few properties all over the place. Right. There's nothing really to indicate here that the one that you would like us to reconsider as your primary home is your primary home. Is there anything you could point to? Well, when, I, when you move house, you, you, you tell everybody where you're, where you're moving to. And I receive mail, the 1121B, all the time. And, you know, I, I live there. I mean, electric, the water, all the stuff, all the things that but, you would normally do is there. What can I show you? Well, I'm sure that electric and water at all the properties you own is probably in your name because no. you own the buildings. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, no, no. A lot of them are all annual rentals. I don't pay for any of that, except the Airbnb, because the guests don't pay for that, but all my other stuff the tenant pays for. Most annual rentals are like that, you know, unless sure. it's a furnished rental where you're renting a turnkey, you may offer to cover all the bills, but most annual rentals, the tenant pays for everything. I pay for the house that I live in and the Airbnbs. Right. Whitney, did you have anything you wanted to ask? Ms. Callahan. <laughs> Who in your home, what's the, the street address? The Enfield Road in Del Rey, the utilities, whose name are those in? Mine. Okay. Um, in the rental listing that you provided, it says that it's available for rent July through October. Is that correct? Yeah. Why is it only available July to October? Because we, whenever it's on the Airbnb market, people come and go, and then um, during those months, we are in the permitting stage right now to build a two-bedroom cottage in the back. Now, it's kind of hard to have people traveling on vacation to come into a house and see all that stuff going on in the back, right? So during that time, and we specifically arranged it to happen at this time of the year, because the busiest time for an Airbnb in Florida is the winter months that we're booked back to back. So when it comes during the summer, I do get some guests, absolutely, but it's the quietest time of the year. So we decided, we started the, the, the design, all the stuff earlier in the year with the intentions of actually building the property on the quieter months. So I put that rental listing on the MLS myself. And with the intention that if someone called up, because I have a price in there that's way below the market price, and I wanted to put it on there, and I was going to explain to interested parties that, look, there's construction going on out the back. That's why this price is low. Your tenant needs to be okay with that. Okay. Now, at the same time, I've told my property manager, Danny, to block off the calendar because the construction is supposed to start in the middle of August. We were running a wee bit late. I've also asked him to block off the calendar on the Airbnb, and then when the middle of August comes, put it on at a very low rate, and once again tell the people, and only rent it out for 30 days at a time, and tell the people that this is why it's so cheap. Okay. All right. I, I want to make sure that I have your timeline uh, right in my head. Right. When did you move to the Cajal property here as your primary residence, in your opinion? It was between July, June, July, August, somewhere then. Now, the way, the way I'm being scarce about that is because... In July, August of sorry, what year? 19. 2019. 19, yeah. Okay. So you maintain that your primary residence has been in Nashville since summer of 2019. Right. You got a homestead exemption in Florida in 2019, correct? Well, yes when you no. say you get it, you, I'd suggest that you have to do something to get it. It was already in there from years ago. I didn't do anything to update okay. it, change it, nothing. So it's you didn't still change, there. So you didn't change a homestead exemption in no. Florida in 2019? You no. didn't change a homestead exemption in Florida in 2020? 
No. You didn't change a homestead exemption in Florida in 2021. No, I need to fix that. I said. Okay, I and need you didn't to fix change that. it in 2022. No. And you haven't changed it for 2023. Not yet, but I will. When you file your federal taxes, what address do you put on your taxes? Uh -huh. My CPA changed. Okay. Do you have a copy of those with you today? No. What do you have with you that you can provide us today that overcomes the zoning administrator's findings that you live at Cajal? Other than what you're telling us, what physical evidence can you provide us? I've just got my license and my purse. I didn't bring anything else. I could have brought bills. I mean, Does your driver's license say Cajal Avenue as your address? Yeah. And you're still registered to vote in Florida? I'm registered to vote, but we well, haven't really voted. I mean, we've registered when two, back in 2010. We did that as something we could do after we got our citizenship, but it, it was like, you're talking 14 years ago almost. I mean, I haven't done anything to change it. Or Where is your vehicle registered? Here. Okay. My husband was very happy that the insurance was half the price up here. Mike, any questions? Okay. Ms. Callahan, thank you so much for your time. The public hearing is now closed, so you can step back to your seat if you like. We're going to discuss this amongst ourselves. And only if we have additional questions for you will we reopen the public meeting and pose questions to you. But for now, can we've heard all we're going to hear for today. Thank you very much. All right. I feel like had there been additional documentation provided, it would have been helpful for us to weigh against the findings provided by the zoning administrator. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks because that's a, that is a hardship <coughs> for me right now. Yeah, um, I, I didn't really hear anything that would cause me to question the decision of the zoning administrator. Um, I know different folks have different levels of comfort with, you know, talking with their neighbors and whatnot, but I have a hard time imagining living full-time someplace six months with a party wall between us and not knowing those two folks' names after six months. Not you to mention a pandemic that went on for two years. Well, I think the current tenants had only been there for like eight months. Okay. Is what, well, nonetheless. Six months and two more coming. But, um, yeah, I just didn't hear any uh, strong case or evidence that would cause me to question the zoning administrator's decision. Mike. I feel the same. Um, I, I don't see any evidence that would say that the zoning administrator made a, uh, made a mistake. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So shall we have a, have a motion? I want to, I, I understand a lot of the things she's saying. I understand maintaining your real estate license in sure. Florida. That doesn't give me pause. Um, I think that there's definitely a problem whether it was you know, it's not for us to decide the issue with the homestead exemption. I think that does certainly cut against her here. Um, if it is accurate, however, that she filed her taxes with this address on there, that her driver's license is here, that her cars are registered here, that that does resonate to me. I just wish we had written documentation of those things. I have to say the driver's license thing does not resonate with me because in order to get your Airbnb license in the first place, you have to have a driver's license that says so. Which we've seen every Tom, Dick, and Harry that's come in here and has not had a uh, had their home as their primary residence, they still will come to us and say, well, I've got this driver's license. Well, of course you have that driver's license. You own the home. We know that. And you're able to document that you own the home in order to get your driver's license changed. And that is what you need to provide in order to get your permit in the first place. So to me, it's never been particularly compelling if your driver's license says so. That was a means to an end in many cases to get that permit. Now, 
my understanding from Metro is that Ms. Callahan provided documentation showing that she Airbnb'd out her house in Florida as some kind of justification that she didn't really live in Florida. And yet the justification she provided, the documentation she provided, shared she lives and works in Delray Beach. So at that time, that was a great opportunity to say, hey, look, every time I have any communication with the federal government, I tell them I live on Cajal. And that was not provided. Now, perhaps today she's kicking herself and would like to go home and come up with that. But the question before us today is, have we seen anything that shows us that the zoning administrator erred? And on the contrary, I think we've, they did a dramatic investigation and we found nothing that contradicts what the zoning administrator found. It's a, it's a fair point, and it's a fair point about the driver's license as well. I think it is a, a point for it, if it if it were as cut and dry as Ms. Callahan would like us to believe, one would think that it would be easier to provide documentation that would show that. Um, I just wish we had more documentation in this case. So I ask again, do we want a motion? Uh, I'll move that uh, we find the zoning administrator did not err in revoking the permit. I second. Can I see a show of hands? The motion carries. So. We have determined that the zoning administrator did not err in his decision, and there won't be any relief granted in this case. So thank you so much for your time today, Mrs. Callahan. We greatly appreciate it. The next case is 2023-60, Carl Fritcher, appellant and owner of the property 2724 Meadow Rose Drive. The appellant is challenging the zoning administrator's decision to deny a short-term rental application due to the residence is not the prim owner's primary dwelling as required by law. Okay. The property is zoned R10. On December 30th, 2022, uh, Mr. Frischer and uh, his wife acquired the property 2724 Meadow Rose Drive. Uh, the deed of trust stated that the owners currently reside at 2721 Eastland Avenue. There was a one to four family rider on the deed of trust. They, re they eliminated the occupant's requirement to be the borrower's principal residence within 60 days for a period of at least one year. 2724 Meadow Rose Drive and 2721 Eastland are back to back and have the same rear property line. On January 3rd, 2023, the Tennessee driver's license was changed four days after the property was acquired. The warranty deed of the owners currently reside at 2721 Eastland Avenue, the owners being Mary and Carl Frischer. On May 3rd, 2023, the permit application was submitted, and on May 15th, the permit application was denied. On May 24th, 2023, there is a quick claim deed um, that had for 2724 Meadow Rose Drive that removed Miss Frischer from the property, but it still had the mailing address as 2721 Eastland Avenue. On May 24th, 2023, United States Postal Service change of address notice was submitted. On May 26th, 2023, Metro change of address notice was submitted. Um, as of June 16th, 2023, no court filings for legal separation or divorce were filed. There's one letter in opposition and four letters in support, and there is a neighbor here in opposition as well. Okay. Mr. Argus? Members board, I want to address you in this case. I think it's the first um, case dealing with divorce, and I came to see you guys in our tiny conference room down on the first floor, mm -hmm. um, and I made a statement in that hearing that I, I want to kind of let you know our policy has changed uh, based uh, principally on comments from, from several members of the board, but also the public too, uh, going forth with divorces. Uh, my brother's recently gone through one, so my family's been affected uh, with one. I've not personally had one. Uh, but. Uh, I had made a statement in the prior uh, case that, hey, once your divorce is final, we'll be happy to process your application. I've amended that to be uh, at least some evidence that you're separating. Because 
I just want you guys to understand the level of, of just outright fraud that we get in our office of folks claiming, hey, we're separated and we don't live together and such. I made that hard stance originally that, hey, your divorce is final, I'll be happy to help you out. Uh, I've since modified that, though. If at least there's some filing with the court, whether it's a legal separation. I'm not a family attorney. I've never practiced that. I, uh, but I, I think there's some documentation in the public record that you could show the world that, hey, we are not together. Um, so I've modified our policy. Of, if they do that, then whichever party is seeking the permit, if they can establish their new domicile, whatever residence that is, that's fine. We'll process their application. Uh, so that has been a stance our office has changed since then. Uh, this particular instance, I think these are adjoining properties. It just, you know, I, I kind of look at the way, sort of the other case, look at the way of the evidence of, that we've got it to make a decision. This is a close case. I've told Mr. Holman that, I think, via email. But, uh, but I, if, if you all feel that this is, is worthy of, of uh, allowing him to do, I'll certainly stand by that and we'll adjust our uh, policies accordingly. It's um, one thing when these, in these, uh, in these cases, you know, we, we do public record searches and having to find, you know, sort of weigh the evidence versus, you know, the ordinance says, hey, turn in one of these two items. Well, if, as you've stated here in the previous case, anybody can go down and change their driver's license like that, you know, register their motor vehicle. Um, but we do do a search when, when the addresses don't come up. And that's, uh, I'll say to the, to the applicants here, uh, uh, it, what may have changed since he's filed this appeal may, you know, may have been a hard line, hey, you got to be done with your divorce, and I'm sorry y'all are going through that. Um, but on the other hand, too, if they do reconcile, the husband or wife, somebody's going to give up a permit. So just, I'm kind of putting that out to the public who watches this to understand if you do have a separation, that at some point you reconcile, and I hope you do, uh, one of those two permits will go away. So I'll, I'll stand by whatever this board does. Again, I'm just not... I wanted to lay off that hard and fast stance I might have presented to you all in our in previous appeals. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Any questions for Metro or for Mr. Targus before we hear from the appellant? And I will not make the same mistake twice. You have five minutes. Oh, we have ten minutes because there's opposition. Okay, see. Oh. I need cue you cards, right you guys. I know. I know. I need to keep notes. There is opposition, so we will have um, 10 minutes and do maintain some of that portion to rebut what you may hear from the opposing witness. Anything I missed? Anything I got wrong? Okay. Um, very good. So I believe we have counsel here. Right. We're going to ask for your name and address for the record. And since I suspect that we'll hear from Mr. Fritcher as well, let's let's for, for good measure have name and address for everyone. Sure. Uh, my name is Jason Holloman. I am uh, counsel at 4210 Park Avenue. And I'll let Mr. Fritcher introduce you. Carl Fritcher, 2724 Meadow Rose Drive. And may I approach legal counsel? I have a case that I wanted to share with everybody, to however it's best to hand it out. And let me dive right in, because I think this is a fairly narrow legal argument. Um, I just want to get the timer going. Sure. <coughs> Tell go. me when you're ready. Go, go, go. Okay. Um, I think this is a fairly narrow legal argument, and I appreciated uh, Mr. Hargis's comments earlier. Um, I, the, first of all, your ordinance... Uh, does require that to meet the owner occupancy requirements, you have to be a permanent resident of that property. And then in order to establish permanent residency, you have to produce two documents that indicate that address. That is your requirement. At the time of his application, Mr. Fritcher did exactly that. Uh, he produced a driver's license, which I think we previously discussed, and he also produced his car insurance policy, which is another uh, possible one of the documents on that list. So if there is a desire to have further requirements, then I would say that is the role of the Metro Council to change that ordinance. But as it stands now, there is no question that his application complied with your ordinance for establishing permanent residency. 
period. There is no reference whatsoever about being married or unmarried in your ordinance anywhere. Now, what I did is find the statute in Tennessee that relates to establishing permanent residency for purposes of elections. So if you want to be a candidate for office, there is a state statute that establishes how you become a permanent resident. And in, in that statute, which is irrelevant here, but I think a little bit instructive, it, it says that one of the, one of the presumptions is uh, that a place where a married person's spouse and family have their habitation is presumed to be the person's place of residence. But a married person who takes up or continues abode with the intention of remaining at a place other than where the person's family resides is a resident where the person abides. And the reason I think that's important is there doesn't even need to be a legal separation. And this is a court of appeals case. It's, it's Fowler versus Middlecroft, where a person ran for and attained public office in Fayette County when his wife and family lived in Memphis, in Shelby County. And, and there is, the court finds in his favor and finds that he did demonstrate residency. So while I do think that there is a natural presumption of residency where your wife and children live, that is not the law, certainly not the law under the Metro Ordinance because it doesn't even reference it, but it's not even the law with regard to holding public office. And there is a Court of Appeals case that I just handed you that reinforces that. They found in his favor and his wife, they were, as far as I know, happily married and continued to be married. So that just isn't the law. And what the law does say is that he has to provide two of those documents. Now, since that time, we have provided additional documents. Uh, and, and Mr. Fritcher was not at the time registered to vote, but he's registered to vote at that address. So I believe that we have completely complied with the requirement for demonstrating uh, that he is a, a permanent resident at this property and the only permanent resident at this property. And I, I did also want to point out, it is not the condition here that his wife holds a separate permit for Airbnb. That's, that's not the case here. So this is the only, this is the only permit in that family. Um, I don't think that really also is either here or there, but I, I do want to just say that to you. So I think with that, I reserve my rest of my time, maybe for rebuttal and also for answering questions. Great. We won't, uh, we won't take your time to ask our questions, but sure. we, you have a minute 20 to address what, whatever you hear from, um, from the neighbor. Um, so thank you so much for that information. What uh, what questions do we have for counsel or for Mr. Um, Fritcher? I'd like to hear from the neighbor first, personally. Can we do can we do that and then do questions to if we heard from the witness? We normally do our Q and A before we hear from the neighbor. I mean, if they want to reserve the remainder of their time for a rebuttal. Yeah. And if everyone is in agreement. Okay. But I think in your roles, you're, you're allowed to answer, ask questions of any witness at any time. At any time? Okay, that's what I like to hear. Okay. okay. I'm just want to make sure you were timing on 10 minutes rather than five. It seemed pretty quick, six yeah. minutes, but it may be fast. You're hundred percent right. As counsel instructed me, I really do need to be taking notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ma'am, if you'd like to step forward, you can take that final seat up there. There's a microphone, and if you could just pull that towards you. And very much like these gentlemen, I'm gonna ask you to state your name and your address for the record. There's a little button there that says push. You're gonna to need to push that in order for us to hear you. Um, and share with us your, uh, the information you wanted to share with us today. Marilyn Rodding, 2725 Meadow Rose Drive. I am totally opposed to an unoccupied short-term rental. It's a large house. They, they could really pack them in. And we, and we do see that. You know, I don't want to paint a scenario that may not, hopefully would not happen, but you know, 
they're they're downtown. They tell people where they live. They follow them home, and then the police are there. Blah blah blah. You've heard all of this, but I I really do oppose this. There's dog walkers, uh, children coming in and out from school or just playing. And, you know, to have that many footprints, I'm not sure the square footage of this house, but it's large. And, and that many footprints, you know, e even at a weekly basis, I oppose it. Understood. Could, could you, it seems to me that you live either across the street or not, across the street from this property? Not exactly. Um, I'm here and they're- Diagonally there. across the street? Uh, the people directly across are next door. Okay. Do you have experience with the matter at hand, which is whether or not this gentleman is a full-time resident at that? So my question is, you're out walking your dog or what have you. Do you see Mr. Fritchert coming and going from that home as his home? I have not seen that, but... You know, I'm, I may not see that. I'm, I'm home every day, out front gardening. Okay. Um, uh, uh, but does but it I appear have not seen that. Uh, so the, the matter before us, if you'll be so kind as to, 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 to hear us out, the matter before us is not whether or not there should be an Airbnb there, that mm -hmm. everyone will have a different opinion about that, but whether or not Mr. Fritchard is eligible to have one whether or not he is the full-time occupant of that as his primary residence. So sometimes we'll hear from residents saying, oh, gosh, I live next door. I haven't seen a light on there except for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. You know, or, oh no, absolutely, I see this gentleman come and go. He waves after he comes home from work. And do you have any experience like that you could share with us? I don't. Uh, maybe the first scenario, I've not seen lights on at night. Uh, I have seen people over um, doing some type of restoration, um, but that's that's all I've seen. And when you saw people over doing restoration, did you have any opportunity to speak to them or to the owners, like understanding, oh, they, they're buying this to flip it or they're buying this to use it as an Airbnb? Do you have any information to share with us in the, that regard? I did speak with his wife. They had a cat missing. And I'm not sure what brought me across the street to talk with her. I think she was, oh, I saw it on the, the neighbor's website. On next door. Yeah. And uh, so I stepped across and just confirmed that she was actually looking for her cat. And um, they had bought the house to prevent a tall skinny going in, which I, that's good. <laughs> That's all. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Nope. Thank you so much for your time, ma'am. We greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. and Chairman, if I may. Yes, please. Um, I know there's been many amendments to our short-term rental ordinance, and there is actually a permanently reside definition that we do have. Um, permanently reside means to occupy a home or unit as one's legal domicile, where the habitation is fixed, to, and to which whenever the person is absent, the person has a definite intention to return. Factors relevant to whether an individual permanently resides at a particular home or unit include, but are not limited to, receipt of mail, registration to vote, licensing for activities such as driving, and the licensing or registration of that individual's personal property. So those are other things we consider. Great. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Greatly appreciate it. Jason, did you want to, you, you do have quite a bit of time left. You have six minutes. Okay, I, I, I was with Joey. I didn't think I'd talk quite that long. Um, <laughs> I, well, I guess in light of, um, of the comments just now, I, I do want to add a couple things. Um, Mr. Fritcher, and I apologize, we, um, we did not, I think, put this in the record, but I'm going to let him say on the record, uh, he has his voter registration card with him, certainly available for you to see, but I'm going to let him just say on the record that he, he does have it and, and what address he has. I do have a voter registration, and 2724 Meadowrose Drive is the address on it. Yeah. And and I believe he's wearing his uh, Vanderbilt ID, and we provided his Vanderbilt employee documents as well, subsequent to the initial denial, that also demonstrates he receives his paycheck there uh, at that residence. Um, you know, families have 
become somewhat more modern in their structure than they were years ago. Um, I think this is admirable. I mean, they, there is no dispute that um, that his wife lives on the property adjacent. I will say um, that also makes for the most impacted neighbor would be people you know, with whom he has a relationship with. Um, I, th I see that as a positive. Um, they are currently separated, and those children reside in the home with her, but they are immediately accessible so that they can come see him, they can live there, or they can they can come back and forth. Um, that's a structure that they've chosen. They're entitled to do that. Um, and under your ordinance, I believe that he has met the requirements to demonstrate to you that this is owner-occupied. And, and, and this isn't some ruse to get a second permit for this family. Um, his wife is not sought to uh, to be a resident of or, or a permanent resident of the other property for purposes of getting a permit. So, you know, I, I kind of understand that concern, but I don't think that's an issue here. So I I don't think anyone's suggesting that's the issue here. We have run into it in the past. I understand. No, I understand. I think the issue here is that is not a property that you could have a non-owner occupied permit at. Correct. And in order to prove that you're owner-occupied, you have to get your voter registration done there. You have to get your driver's license done there. Right. So those are tasks that will that are a means to an end, to prove that you are the permanent resident. I think the, the question at hand is, is that in fact the case? That is the question at hand. Right. The and fact that the, the, the uh, uh, you know, apparently estranged wife hasn't applied for a, a permit of her own is not our issue. No, only, I only raised that because it was brought up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it has happened. It has happened. I understand. Without and and the, the, the last thing I, I guess I will address just because it was raised by the city um, is th this right, the, the, the mortgage structure permits them to have this as a full-time rental. Um, it does not have an owner-occupied requirement, as some mortgages do, but that does not mean he can't occupy it as his primary residence. I mean, I think that is probably known to the board, um, but there's in no way a prohibition on him doing that. That just gives them more flexibility, um, you know, if he decides to do something different at a later time. At this time, uh, he doesn't want to have a full-time tenant in there because he wants to live there. I mean, quite frankly, they could do that, um, but he's chosen this structure so that he can be near his children uh, during this time, and the Airbnb allows them to financially afford. I mean, as the neighbor conceded, um, they did a good thing here. They bought this historic home to prevent it from being knocked down and have two tall skinnies put in there. I think that was a benefit to the neighborhood, and this is a financial structure uh, that allows them to sort of sort out, you know, and I, I frankly think it's unfortunate we're having to talk about their marriage here at a public meeting. But but we are, and this allows them to sort that out, and it allows them a financial means uh, to to manage that additional expense of a mortgage without a full time tenant. So right, thank you. Okay, gentlemen, there's about a minute left on my counter for you if you have anything else to share, and if not, we're going to pose. Do you folks have any questions for for Mr. Fritcher or for Mr. Holloman before we have a public hearing? I have one for Mr. Hargis. Oh, okay, Joey. Mr. Hargis, um, so we know that there are some documents that, some boxes that you must check uh, to have a successful permit application. Um, we also, I think everybody who's been around knows that those documents are not super difficult to sure. go change over so what is what is your thought process when when you get an application that um you know first round they didn't have the boxes checked then they come back with all the boxes checked where do you see um what's what's your thought process behind the boxes are checked and yet we're still not issuing this happy to walk through that uh it, when applications initially come in uh it, it, again if if you've got as, as mr hall was described you've got documentation showing uh, that you permanently reside at the location, uh, and there's no no type of information on the on my staff's initial review to the contrary. That permit gets issued. You know, um, take the take the previous case. I, I don't want to impute that on this applicant in any way. But when we do get conflicting documentation in the public record, that's when I asked um, the inspection staff to do bigger public record searches. You know. 
homestead exemptions and court filings and, and all of that. It's pretty extensive. I'm quite surprised how much is available uh, on, on a public record search to look at that. Uh, we have been in discussions with this council and, and we'll have discussions with the, with the uh, future Metro Council to amend the, the local regulations to require additional information. Um, our, our ordinance does say that you must permanently reside in, in the court, as, as uh, Ms. Trollman's pointed out in this case, deals with election. There's one standard. Uh, the case I've told y'all about, uh, Dewey versus Sumner County, was a um, tax case uh, that, that spelled out domicile. Uh, but that's the intent is this is their full-time property. Uh, the council in their wisdom has, has chosen not to put any kind of time limits on a house, so you can rent it 365 days a year. Um, I question, are you really an owner-occupied at that point? But that's the council's point. But um, kind of taking all those factors into account, looking at, at the records, if everything's in, uh, and, and I had no nothing to the contrary, uh, what popped in, in this gentleman's case is, is our staff listed in the thing that the other records that we found, you know, voter registrations over at the, the other residence, uh, those types, you know, are, they're pointing elsewhere rather than the subject property, and that's that's why we denied. But um, certainly, and, I, and I'll tell this for all applicants too, uh, even up to this meeting today, if, if you bring documentation that, that crosses the line for me, we'll withdraw the case. We'll issue the permit. So there's not a, just because you get a denial letter from me or a, uh, that's not the end of it. Um, certainly supply more. I'm, I'm always open and my staff sometimes, uh, other zoning administrators were probably less open than me at sometimes to their frustration uh, that, that, that I'll accept stuff right up till one o'clock today if, it, if it's valid enough and it you know meets the threshold. This one I struggle with a little bit in his case. He's, uh, Mr. Hallman uh, did submit, kind of crossed that line for us in this case, but I need some, some guidance and that can come from this board and your rulings and hey, in this situation, here's how we handle it. Um, for me, I, I think just referencely, if this wasn't an adjoining property, I probably wouldn't have an issue with it. Uh, in this case, it's it's directly adjoining. It's right across the back, back. Just for me, didn't kind of meet the you know test when you're you're kind of there. I mean, I just and I understand everybody's situation is different, but I, I want y'all to understand and, and the applicant too, kind of the the whirlwind that we deal with of you know. Sure. Um, because we, we literally do get husbands and wives both apply for oh, yeah. properties uh, where they can't both, they either, you know, I, I guess I live in a world, maybe it's old old fashioned that married couples live in the same house. I just, you know, so I do have to try to throw some common sense that maybe it's not in the bright letter of the text that the Metro Council posed, but as an administrator, I'm supposed to read the gray, like, what do you really mean? What are you trying to, to make it work? So, so hope that, was, that helps that, explain. That was kind of the question I was going to ask you, Joe, as long as we have you up here, is, you know, uh, council pointed out that, you know, you asked for X and Y and Z, and we gave you X and Y and Z, so what's the problem? But there, the, those are the minimums, and the, you you have discretion, they yes? Are. They are. They, it is not just a, I check two boxes and here's your permit. Now, prior zoning administrators may have done it that way. Um, I, I feel that, that the intent of this and, and the level to which the complaints our office gets of these people do not reside where they're telling you, uh, where I change the business process, let's ask for more, let's go dig a little bit, let's make sure that's what they're, you know, from the same point, we're keeping honest people honest, and I'm not in any way saying this man's disingenuous, but that's the part for us that initially, as my staff member talked, you know, some of the other records we looked at, you know, car registration, voter ID, we're all at the the marital residence, so that's that's why the initial denial. I, I have no issues if you all issue this permit. I, um, I'm even happy to withdraw this case if it makes it easier for you uh, procedurally. I think there's enough here that, that 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 I'm okay with this one. I just don't want to be on record. You know, other people will watch this telecast and say, "Oh, Mr. Hargis, oh, you check two boxes and here's your permit." That's that's not exactly well, how we're going to do that. Um, it, it, I think the if. It's the it's the permanently reside provision is kind of what we're looking at here. So yes, boxes were checked, but you know you're looking at the information available to you to determine whether that person permanently resides. And I and I also said in my initial statement, I, I we've tempered that. I've tempered that from my initial hearing in that conference room, uh, where it's hey, get your divorce final and then come see me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hey, at least give me some evidence that you two are set. I mean, I could. If I accepted everyone at face value, and I know that's not a that's not a threshold I want to give to people's children of don't take people at face value, but in this in this scheme we have to really look and scrutinize the applications to be sure what they're telling us is truthful. And, and based on the public records we had at the time, uh, it appeared that hey, wait a minute, you live over here, not 
where you're saying. So that, that was the initial denial of that. I have no issues in, in this particular instance, um, whatever count, your legal counsel thinks and, is best uh, okay. in this. I, I, just to say, I will say on record, I think he's crossed the line here. I think we're, he's fine. <laughs> if I'd had, the, you know, if we'd been through this information, and to Mr. Holland's credit, he goes, I did give it to you a week <laughs> or two ago. He did. But I really want to have this hearing and talk through these issues. And it helps us, you know, on the next ones and that we come to until the council well, changes I, ordinance or the you, state legislature tells us. It, if I could, the, the, um, when, you, when you refreshed the standard that you had expressed at the small room meeting for uh, that conference room meeting that we had, um, you did say that you would you would like to see a court filing, something yeah, some, that some, 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 something separation. in the public record that says, "Hey, we're not together publicly." Is, okay, is there fine. anything in this case? I mean, we have the quit claim deed, but this, this one they've they've not crossed that line in my mind. To, to Mr. Almonds, I'll, I'll admit that there's nowhere in the ordinance, but I'm I'm trying to balance. Um, Intent of the council and enforcing the ordinance. I, I've not seen that, but if, if you are comfortable with that, I don't. I'm fine. We'll just we'll revamp our processes. And may I just add, if I can, um, they they did uh, unwind their property ownership. He he entirely owns his property by quick claim, so he's the sole owner. She's the sole owner of the other property, so which I would argue is pretty significant. Their major marital asset has been separated and dissolved. Um. There's a note in here, and I, I don't know who's going to answer. TDL, TDL change. What, I'm sorry, what is State the... driver's license. Okay, Tennessee driver's license change for that. For and that changed property. just a couple days after we bought the property. Understood, yeah. understood. Um, I really don't want to ask horribly personal questions, and I'm not interested in the, you know, details. But I'm just interested in the timeline. So if you would be so kind, Mr. Fritch, whatever you feel comfortable answering, but it will help me to see this case more clearly, if, if you don't mind. And even if you do mind, but I was going to ask anyway. So um, the your dr driver's license changed four days after you bought this property, and you bought this property with your wife together. It was originally purchased as an investment property, mm -hmm. and then during the purchasing process, we decided we were going to separate, and it made most sense for me to live at that property because then I would the children would be able to see me every day if, if, you know, yeah. and, um, you might, but, the, the length of time that the negotiation on the purchase took, I mean, it was a, it was like a 30 day sale. It, it didn't it take you several months before you were able to yeah. close on the property. And I didn't move into the house until March. Okay. And everything else, because I realized in order for me to afford to live there, I would need some extra income through short-term rental in order to stay there and then i started the process of getting everything i needed for this okay do you own any other properties besides this one no. or do you does your wife own any property other than the one that abuts this no and when you said you bought it for an investment property were you planning to flip it or have long-term renters or um, do short-term renting? Originally, I think it was going to be a long-term rental. Explain how you came to purchase it. Um, so the, the house went up for sale and developers were under contract. They were going to rip it down and build the two tall, skinny houses up. And that would mean it would back up all the way to my fence and their balconies would overlook my backyard. I didn't want that. <laughs> And Understood. we had the opportunity to do it, so we saw that would be a good investment. And that was our reasoning behind it. Anyone have any questions? I, I, I have a question for Ann. I know that in the past when we've had a small group like this, just the four of us, because we would have to be unanimous on this. We have in our rules somewhere that we can delay a decision or hold the case until there's a uh, larger group. I just read this. You just have to have a majority of your quorum, and your quorum is four. Sorry, I just I read it Please, to get ready for today. Right so it, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it, I, I believe it's just three, but I'll certainly defer to your legal counsel. 
So um, the rules is revised, right? So if there's like a tie in the vote, that's okay. a situation where you'd revert to go to the next meeting. Okay. But otherwise, it's a majority of your those present. It's, okay. Yeah. Any other questions before we discuss this amongst ourselves? Okay. Gentlemen, thank you so much for all the information and for answering our questions. And I apologize if anything was uh, overly personal. We are now going to discuss this amongst ourselves. So the public hearing is closed. If and when we have questions for you, we may reopen it, but otherwise assume that we're all done. Whitney, go. I am fine with granting the permit in this case. To me, um, it's your mic on. It is. Sorry. To me, you know, the the timing of the change of the driver's license, the um, fact that they have unwound their property interest to be separated, um, the numerous support documents from various neighbors way into my decision as well. Um, you know, he's he's moved a lot of things. Granted, several of them, as far as changes of address, came after um, the quote-unquote denial. Um, but it's still a lot to unwind and separate. And I think that they have crossed the threshold here um, that I don't believe anything nefarious is afoot. Yeah, I um, I find the the you know quit claiming actually moving the property over, and she's the sole owner of the other home. He's the sole owner of this home. Um, also, this is not really what's before us. But if this were a very large HPR that they owned both units on, and they were still together, this would be. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is, even if like the impact to the area, I don't think you've still got you've still got. Even if we did not believe the appellant, um, you've still got the owners on the property, essentially, because of the way these two properties adjoin. It's not a great argument. I, I don't really need to bring it up. So, yes, the the legal documentation of the properties being separated is what I find compelling here. I'm in agreement. I think that um, uh, I can understand the denial at the moment, um, but I, I do think that since uh, since then that uh, the appropriate uh, steps have been followed and document documents have materialized that um, seem to lead me in the direction that that there's nothing shady going on here, and that I believe that the, that this is the case that it is an owner occupied residence. Well, let me ask you guys this. How do you feel about the kind of precedent that this sets that, you know, well, they're not divorced, they're not legally separated, we've seen nothing to document that they're separated, and it, it's always been a pretty low bar to prove that it's owner-occupied, change your driver's license, change your voter registration card, big whoopee, very often it's in the same zone, same area, so you aren't materially changing anything. And now the one, the one thing we've seen here that's different is the change of address card, which again, these are neighboring properties, so that's really no skin off anybody's nose to just pop over to a different mailbox. And that while they both owned two properties, they've now split it up and split it up and one is one, one owns one and one owns the other. So anyone who comes before us in the future it's like, okay, well, it used to be driver's license and red photo registration. Now we need to make sure that we unwind the properties from each other, and then we should, that, that should, you know, confirm that we are separated. You cool with that going forward? Unfortunately, I think I am. Okay. Um, I, because there is no uh, mandate to have a filed divorce decree, mm -hmm. um, no legal separation. I, I, again, I mean, I, we struggle with this every time that there's a, an owner-occupied um, uh, where we have to, to see proof of it, um, that I wish that there was something more clear and cut and dry, but I think that based on, I, we, we can't really, unfortunately, um, uh, look to a, um, a 
marital dissolution as showing that because and it's and I know personally it takes a very long time for that to happen. Um, uh, it, it would be clearer if there were, um, but I don't think we can hold them to that. Is there? I wonder if um, the zoning administrator or staff who look at these. I mean, I get I get tons of emails about you know what we suspect are false permit applications when people get the notice in the mail. Um, so I, can someone speak to perhaps the zoning administrator or Mr. Osborne? Um, uh, do we need do to reopen you, the public record in order to ask Mr. Osborne a question? No. No, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I guess the question, Mr. Osborne, is you know, do, do you view um, the do you view granting this permit as setting a precedent that would make it more difficult for y'all to deny cases where there actually is not separation? Um, it could, but each of these are always unique. I mean, we look at generally, we generally take the same steps to look into each application. Um, some of those lead down different paths, you know, depending on the information we find. Um, so, I mean, we're going to take the same steps, we kind of, regardless of what, what comes here, we just may take y'all's advice and, you know, we'll talk it with over with Joey or, or Mac as we do with all of these applications that we think may be fraudulent. I think that what I'm hearing from board members is just we want to make sure that we're not doing anything that would say, okay, well, here's just another box that fraudulent applicants can check and then be more um, likely to get a permit. So is that... I think it's always a concern on, on our end. Um, I mean, at the end, at the end of the day, the, the Metro Council decides what ordinances say. So, I mean, that, you know, that potential ruling from this board or from the BZA, which I also staff, like, okay, there's a code change, you know, go write a new code and put that in there. So, I mean, we can remedy it legislatively up until, up to or until the legislature says we can't. So, um, you know, happy if it's, Fine. We can we can write scenarios. Ordinances aren't written for every possible scenario. I mean, that's where I come in. I got to fill in the gray between. You know, we got some standards. We just add some new standards. But I mean, will it have an effect? Sure, it will. But again, too, to Mr. Osborne's part, I, we do look at each of them individually. Hey, get us some more info. We're seeing this. You know, um, like like the prior case, JD calls the secretary down in Palm Beach County. Is it still active? Yep. Okay. Well. Yeah. You know. Joey, let me ask you this only because it's never come up. If, if the case were to be where we, where we did not issue the permit, would Mr. Fritcher be able to re since the permit was never issued, would Mr. Fritcher be able to reapply in three or six months after having kind of established his presence there? Like the neighbors can say, like, yeah, you know what, I, I can't, I can't deny that somebody's there Monday night at. 6:30. I can't deny I see the kids coming back from soccer practice. You know. Uh, well, I don't want to approach this the the applicant. Yes, he could always reapply unless this board now the you know cases where you've in, you know it's a one year ban or something we don't do that. But right. any any particular case, I think certainly reapply and provide additional documentation um, that, that satisfies that. Okay, yeah, we think you're here. And if for us I, again, I have no issues if if you all grant the case and say hey. I mean, we are kind of looking at it of, hey, how to handle the next one that's like, that's like Mr. Pritchard's. Now, not all of them are like this, you know. So it's, I, I, I want to kind of balance of, this is not a blanket. We're changing everything we do over this one case. That's not the case. But in instances where I run into the same situation, that Mr. Pritchard, you sure I'm going to handle it a little differently. So I hope that's fair. I mean, I'm just trying to, sure. at least until such time we, we write a different ordinance. Uh, but it's not a, you know, here we go from this point forward. Right, right. Um, it's not to that extent. I think the point is well taken that these cases, we, we wouldn't exist as a board if there was not some subjectivity in these cases. And you can't create a bright line rule for every single scenario. I think that there, for me, there are differences in this case than in previous divorce cases that we have looked at. Um, to the extent that we need to consider in the future whether there is um, a new whether we we want to 
have Metro Council consider or Metro Council does want to consider something of a rule change in regards to a scenario like this, I think that that is something to consider. But I also think that um, from a public policy perspective, it is hard to think about there are many people who are never going to file the legal documents for separation um, for a variety of reasons, whether that is means to do so, knowledge to do so, whatever it is, public policy would seem in my mind to want to dictate reconciliate, would want to encourage reconciliation. I would be leery of adopting a bright line rule that does not encourage potential reconciliation um, for purposes of jumping through a short-term rental hoop. Um, I think given that, given the discussion of the fact that you can't always have a bright line rule and that is why we exist, in weighing the factors in this case, and what's been presented to us in this case, I have no problem finding that there is an error by the zoning administrator. I think, though, if we're going to talk about public policy, we have to address the fact that there is a public policy interest in keeping non-owner-occupied Airbnbs or short-term rentals out of these residentially zoned. The reason that this couldn't have been granted as a non-owner-occupied is they're not permitted in this zone, right? right. So if we say, Okay, there's a public policy interest that would encourage reconciliation among the married the, the married couple. We also have to remember the public policy issue of not letting a how many thousand square foot home in a residential zone turn into a party house, which is what the neighbor spoke to us about today. But the testimony from the neighbor, while I certainly appreciate the fact that she took time out of her day to come doesn't speak to the issue at hand here. And the support that we have does speak to the issue at I'm hand. I'm just saying if there's a public policy issue at hand about Fair. reconciliation of a married, a married couple, there's a public policy issue also at hand about keeping non-owner-occupied short-term rentals out of zones where non-owner-occupied short-term rentals aren't permitted. Which is why we exist. Right. For that public policy reason. But in my opinion, I, I also, we have always as a board shown great deference to um, information that we receive from neighbors and in this scenario if you have neighbors saying I can confirm they are living separately I, that to me also bolsters unwinding it, it bolsters the unwinding of the properties and everything else you know it's interesting we got four letters of support none of them said they're living separately they were all form letters they're all exactly the same at least one does <clears throat> and members i mean that's all through this even if he's granted a permit by y'all day which and and i also support couples getting back together especially if there's <laughs> children involved so i always support that um the neighbors and the complaints they're on watch if he's not living there they're going to complain again right. and we're going to investigate it I but mean, it this, is this granting is not a blank check forever that he gets to <clears> right, show call it. We'll, we'll go through the process you know as, as well yet. very difficult it, sure. to revoke a permit right the state has made it we difficult we've, we've done quite a few okay so well the, through this three strike process it's very difficult but if someone's obtained a permit on false pretenses then that's different than the three strikes that's thing. a good point yep okay Thank great you. well what do you guys think just for a point of the record tanya lewis wrote in support and said we know the applicant well tanya lewis and christopher Kelly, we know the applicant well as a neighbor and can attest to the fact that he is indeed the primary owner and resident that he and his that's wife right. are in fact separated, separated living separately you're absolutely right i do remember seeing that absolutely right all right, does anyone want to make a motion? I move that the zoning administrator aired and that he can apply for his, or his permit should be granted. Is that the appropriate wording for this one? Should we say granted or reconsidered? Reconsidered. Because I, I don't want to, because if it's other information could, could come to light that I would. I want to make sure that I get the, the language right. Robert's giving us a nod with reconsidered. Okay, so let me. <laughs> I move uh, that the, to find that the zoning administrator erred and that this permit can be reconsidered. 
do I hear a second? Oh, hold on. Oh. <laughs> this all together. I'm you sorry. came up with all sorts of intention. Do I hear a second, second on that now. motion? Okay. Shall I see a show of hands? Very good. The motion passes. And that was for the record with for three the votes. Record, yeah, that, that, I did not vote in, in support, but Godspeed for those who did. Okay, super. The reason I was coming up here is to remind you about the rules change. Oh, yes. I was going to run for the hills. We have a rules change, right, to discuss. Is it the public comment issue? I think there were some typos and some rules, y'all. Okay. I don't have that exactly in front of me right this second. And so, do you have I believe, a So you, re, you approved new rules in March. Yes, ma'am. And then after that point, when Mac and Joe went to post it, they found a few typos. Okay. And I said, it just has to go back before you, before okay. you post it again. So, but I don't believe in this version, those typos are highlighted. So, um, so I don't know if you want to supply a highlighted version, maybe at the next meeting. I can't speak to what the changes were. Okay. I didn't make them, so. Well, we already have housekeeping to handle in August, so we'll just make it. Yeah. Okay. So we will. Will get, do we need to make a motion to table that for next meeting? Sure. Or? Why don't you make a motion to defer that till your next? Okay. Meeting? Yeah. I move to defer the rules change discussion to the August meeting or whatever our next meeting is. Do I hear a second? Great. Show of hands. Done. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.